Oh, so this is continuation of uh, globalisation and the law. This is uh, the session regulating bad behaviour online, maybe elsewhere as well, but certainly we'll start with online. Uh, Judge David Harvey almost needs no introduction, as our previous speaker did, uh, need no introduction. I must say I have appeared before him several times uh, in the courts, uh, clarify as an advocate only, uh, but there's time, I guess, for both of us. Um, so uh, certainly one of the most internet savvy uh, of the members of the bench. There are some who would say that doesn't take a lot, uh, but not me, but not me. Um, so, uh, with no further ado, uh, Judge David Harvey will facilitate the session for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The session is about regulating bad behaviour online, and I thought I'd just take a moment or two to introduce it and explain how it was that the session comes about. Uh, at the end of 2010, as a result of an extravagant comment by the then Minister of Justice, Simon Power, who described the internet as a wild west, the Law Commission was charged with reviewing the adequacy of the regulatory environment for news media. <clears throat> and there were three issues that the Law Commission was asked to address. What the definition of news media was, which doesn't interest us today, whether or not the Broadcasting Standards Authority and the Press Council should have an extended jurisdiction, which again doesn't interest us today. But finally, whether the existing criminal and civil remedies for wrongs such as defamation, harassment, breach of confidence and privacy are effective in the new media environment, and if not, what alternative remedies may be available. So we're going to focus on that. And they're referred to, or have been referred to in some of the fora that have discussed these issues as speech harms, as well as bad behaviour online. So the minute you say that, you're opening up a door to all sorts of interesting cans of worms. Anyway, December last year, the Law Commission releases the issues paper. And submissions were called for, and the submission period ended at the end of March, and the Law Commission was going to go away and put together a recommendations paper and submit that to government. But there was an intensive campaign in the New Zealand Herald, I'll use, just use the word intensive, there are other words which could be used, which focused upon cyberbullying, and the new Minister of Justice, Judith Collins, asked the Commission to accelerate its recommendations regarding misbehaviour online. So what the Law Commission has discussed and recommended is firstly that the statute book be reviewed to look at all the provisions imposing controls on communication to see whether or not they cover the digital environment. They suggested a new offence of what's called malicious impersonation of another person, that is, using somebody else's identity, amending the Harassment Act to remove any doubt that its provisions could cover cyberbullying and online intimidation, clarify offences relating to the misuse of a telephone device and extend telecommunications into the digital environment. Change the Human Rights Act to remove doubt about publications likely to excite hostility or against or bring people into contempt on the grounds of colour, race, ethnic or national origins. And consider amending other uh, sections of the Human Rights Act to reflect that cyberspace should be viewed as a public place. So having made those recommendations, what about enforcement? Well, it was suggested in the issues paper that there be either a communications commissioner operating rather like the privacy commissioner who would make recommendations, or alternatively a communications tribunal that would operate at a lower level than the court system administering a speedy remedy for online harms. It wouldn't be for trivial complaints, for demonstrated breaches of the law. There would have to be demonstrable harm having resulted or likely to result and that harm may be financial, psychological, distress, intimidation, humility, humiliation, or fear for safety. Now, what has happened since, and I'm uh, authorised to say this, is that the Law Commission is considering putting the Communications Commissioner and the Communications Tribunal together into one body, so that the Commissioner would act as an educational, facilitative, screening type of organisation before cases were referred to the Communications Tribunal for disposition. So that's the sort of background that we're operating under. 
The recommendations of the Law Commission to the Government are in the process of being completed now. We won't have an opportunity to make any more submissions on them before they are presented. But if there is legislation to follow, one hopes that it will be referred to a select committee. And that will be the place where any submissions <coughs> or further discussion may take place. But the purpose of this session is to look at the issue of bad behaviour online. And you can gather from what the Law Commission has already said that the existing law in some respects does address bad behaviour. But really, I think the first question that we've got to ask and answer is what do we understand by bad behaviour? And to what extent are we prepared to see, if we're prepared to see any, restriction on free speech and freedom of expression uh, online? And look at the harms that are occurring and take it from there. So, any thoughts about bad behaviour? It's a very wide concept. Anybody? Yes. Back in the days of Usenet, online forums, every um, every other community that existed online, it was it was you know a very common practice that it was the the community established its own standards. Yes. Um, and so I guess I mean I have a problem with this because I I, I see um, a lot of room for abuse of the idea of bad behaviour, um, you know, from anything from just merely disagreeing from some from, with somebody could be considered trolling. Um, I see the term misapplied quite liberally these days. Um, uh, obviously, I'm not in favour of harassment, but I'm allowed to disagree with people or have a personal opinion about them, right? Well, if you used if you used Usenet, you'd you'd recall that there were some so there was some very robust discussion that uh, went on. And of course, that's where the term <coughs> claiming and trolling came from. Yeah. But um, so, what I'm wondering is, at what point does the community enforcement and um, merely banning users become a a civil issue? So what you're suggesting is that the particular online community should regulate itself? Well, what I'm suggesting, well, they already do, obviously. Yeah, um, absolutely. What I'm saying is, at what point does just saying, get out, um, not enough? And at what point does it actually become a case for the legal system? OK. Can I, can I avoid the, the second part of your question sure. uh, and, and, and go to the first part and ask for some views on that? Um, because... Within a, a, an environment, within a community such as Usenet, um, that, that could be fine. But the problem that we're getting is that we're getting people who are setting up web pages that can be used for abuse and all sorts of terrible things that go way beyond defamation. Very, very hurtful. We're seeing people on blogs who are using the blog as a, uh, as a means of causing other people distress. Uh, we're seeing people using Twitter and, and, and Facebook uh, as a means of, of upsetting people. Now, Twitter and Facebook may be examples of your community, but what about the blogs? What about the web pages? Where's the community that's going to regulate those? Ah, right. Okay, yes, sir. Okay, so we're, we're looking at, at a whole range of protocols across the internet. Yes. About news media. Is this on? Yep, it is now. Um, I guess the question was around um, the difference between what, you, what you're, you're discussing, what uh, hurtful speech or things that are causing people distress. Yes. What are facts for one person can be distressing for another? So, I mean, and, and what. Do we have a definition of what it requires? You know, is it sufficient that something causes someone distress in order to consider it um, in, the, in this category of, um, of behaviour that yep. warrants legal intervention? The answer, the answer to your question is yes, uh, and indeed it can be true. Uh, and that comes under the, the uh, umbrella of the Harassment Act because what you have within the Harassment Act at the moment is a, is a two-stage test. You have something that is hurtful to me and, and, and I'm disturbed by it. Now, you may say, what? 
he's disturbed by it, that's absolutely nothing. But you've got to look at it from my subjective point of view. And then what you've got to do is apply a second test, which is an objective test. Is that reasonable for a person in my set of circumstances to feel that way? So it can be true, yes, and indeed there have been cases where true stuff has been found to be harassment. Um, the next thing that follows, of course, is whether or not there's a remedy available. So, and that's another question. Yeah, um, does that I, answer the question? It, well, it, it does answer the question, but it raises, I guess, the, the question of, um, say, freedom of religion, where mm -hmm. you, you have two, two different religious points of view yep. which are in conflict, and the adherents of one belief obviously believe theirs is absolute truth. The other, the other belief believes that they're the absolute truth, and they both <coughs> believe each other are complete heresies. And obviously, in, in another. Well, that's been going on as long as. Obviously, yes, yeah. Yeah. But, but the point the is early Christian know. churches are a really good example. They just excommunicated people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. It was so the, a lot, rather like your example. Exactly. Yeah. But, Oh, okay. That's interesting. Back to you. I'm sorry. We were talking about the 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 the, sorry. the, 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 tr the true facts that, that are in direct conflict with one another. Yep. Yes, I mean, uh, I, you know, obviously from each from each perspective, they believe that they're selling, saying something true or at least genuine. They have a genuine belief, um, and that genuine belief, when communicated to the other person, is actually hurtful. And the other person is genuinely hurt. I'm not, so in other words, I'm saying both yep. people are being completely genuine. Um, the, the whole point of free speech, there's, there's no point in having free speech if, you, if you're going to limit it when it hurts someone. Oh, sure. Freedom for the freedom to express the thought we hate. Yes. It's, that, was, that was what Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes described it as. Yeah. And yeah. it can be a genuine harm that people can feel. Yeah, um, absolutely. By it. I agree. And, and it's a fine balance, and it's a very difficult one. David. Uh, thanks, David. <coughs> just want to comment on limits and powers. And I think we need to be careful when we talk about what's the real problem out there, cyberbullying, harassment, how much the law can do. There was a good example in the paper this morning, if you saw, of a London young woman who got cyberbullied and harassed off Twitter because she tweeted, is Wimbledon held in London every year? and 21,000 people replied to her, um, all in fairly um, derogatory terms, uh, remarking on her intelligence. Now, no law, I think, is ever going to change uh, situations like this. In terms of what the law can do, though, if I'm going to just touch on what I call a good power and a bad power, the bad power which causes me some concern is the talk of a body that's not a full court having takedown powers, if, for example, I hold the opinion that Jamie is a scumbag and I say they're on my blog and I'm willing to take the legal consequences for it, I have some hesitation about somebody being able to say, you must remove that from uh, the internet. Plus, to be blunt, it won't work anyway if you're really committed. The strides in effect, you know, it can appear elsewhere. What, though, I think can be an innovative solution, most people, I think, are worried about reputation. The most common request I get from my blog is, oh, if you Google my name, something someone said about me on your blog, or something I myself once said comes up really high, I don't want future employers to see it. Now, let's say, for example, I'd said um, Jamie is a bankrupt, and that's actually not true. Defamation isn't actually, for most people, affordable, and if you're taking on sometimes people on the internet with no money, it's absolutely futile. What I think could be a good power for the proposed tribunal commissioner is the power of arbitration and finding of fact, where they could go in and say, well, what's your proof that he's a bankrupt? And Jamie would say, I'm not bankrupt. A company I used to be a director of went bankrupt. Does it all false, by the way. Uh, but that was two years. Uh, yes, thank you. That was two years after I left that company, nothing to do with me. And if that tribunal or commissioner made that finding a fact, then I think people would link to it. Media, like they do with Press Council, BSA would link to it. And what happens in Google? That would probably go up high in the Google page rank. Because I think the best way to fight bad info on the internet is generally with good info. 
You probably can't get rid of nasty stuff someone's determined to say about you, but if there was a low cost on the papers method available for people to be able to clear their names effectively, that's certainly a model which I hope you know, the Law Commission may look at. Thank you. Thank you, David. Is there anything arising? Y yes. <laughs> if Mostly false. Sorry, can I? Over, over, uh, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> David was, was talking about um, false speech that was um, defamatory, but I'm just wondering about false speech in general and, and hoping you could touch on the um, U.S.'s uh, uh, Stolen Valor Act, um, the Supreme Court decision saying that false speech is actually protected speech in the U.S. Um, how is that going to impact on uh, uh, these issues here in New Zealand? I think James Gilmore, who was a, a writer on the internet in the early days, said that the fr First Amendment is a local ordinance, um, and, and it is. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a freedom of expression uh, right uh, in New Zealand under the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act, the freedom to impart and to receive uh, information, but the Bill of Rights Act is, is a little bit hedged around. Um, your false information uh, uh, right of speech, uh, well, you know, the First Amendment allows an awful lot of stuff that wouldn't be allowed in, in, in other countries, um, from Russia all the way through to China and, and, and so on. To give you an example of false speech or uh, irony um, uh, as, as a speech that, that caused some difficulty, there is the case of um, uh, the Queen and Chambers uh, currently under appeal before the English Court of Appeal, where Mr Chambers was snowed in at an airport uh, in the Midlands and put a tweet out that um, if they didn't get rid of the snow within four days, he was going to blow the effing place up. Um, and, of course, he wasn't going to, but the authorities took umbrage at this and they prosecuted him and he's been found guilty uh, and, and has been fined but there's an issue of speech there. Of course it was not, uh, it, it wasn't a threat. Uh, he's not a terrorist. Uh, he just wanted to get to see his girlfriend in Ireland. Um, but, you know, that was, that was kind of false speech as well, and, it, and it's being prosecuted. So you have different, different rules for different, different countries, uh, and I think that sort of might deal with the issue of the First Amendment. The problem that you have with the First Amendment is that with the Internet, the First Amendment now applies worldwide, even if it is a local ordinance, because that false stuff does get out there. I'm, I'm much more interested in, in New Zealand. Is sure, false speech so protected? am I. Yeah. Uh, would false speech be protected? Um, depends on whether or not it's defamatory. Um, you know, I could, I could broadcast a falsehood. The sun isn't going to rise today. So what? <laughs> it's, fa it's false, and I put it out on Twitter. Does it, what, what is the meaning? What's the significance of that? It de you see, the thing is, and, and I hate to be a lawyer on this, it depends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, context is everything. Um, but, um, you know, if it is false, and if it's going to cause somebody harm, either reputational harm or psychological harm, then there may be a remedy a remedy under our law that isn't available under American law. I don't know if the, what the threshold is for uh, speech to become harassment. I would imagine in the US it would be pretty high under the, um, uh, with the First Amendment. Thank you. Okay. I, I'm sorry I can't be more direct. Russell. Um, with the Queen versus Chambers case, it strikes me that you might quite quickly get to a situation where uh, your communications tribunal is telling a higher court not to be so stupid, this man was clearly just joking. There um, are occasions when lower tribunals would love to do that. Uh, but <laughs> <coughs> is it going to be able to do that? Um, well, if, if the matter was referred to a communications tribunal rather than being prosecuted by the police then the Communications Tribunal would deal with it, I guess, under the, under the new uh, rule uh, proposed, uh, and that would be an end of it, unless would, there was some kind of appeal. Would the Tribunal like. be able to tell the police not to prosecute? Uh, no. Uh, courts can't tell the police not to prosecute. Courts can dismiss prosecutions, but they can't tell the police not to prosecute. 
Okay. Yes. I, I was attracted to David's comment about arbitration, and I think there's that word mediation, which is kind yes. of the sister. And I think for good players, for people of goodwill who are actually trying to get some redress locally, those things are great. But the second part of what he said about, and the linking will mean that it rises in weight in Google, I think we can see that there's bad sides to that. First of all, Santorum's name is obviously mud now. And whilst I think it's amusing, and from this distance politically it's a wonderful outcome if you're of my political persuasion, it's very bad for him. And it's almost impossible to eradicate. And the other part of this is privatising that aspect of the, in, the innate searchability of all statements, true or false, has a very strange effect on the social equity here. You can pass a statement that that was an incorrect act and should not have happened, but withdrawing it from the public eye is immeasurably harder than it used to be. And my great fear is that just as people used to milk money from the publishing industry by waiting for the book to get out the door and then suing because their name had been introduced and make them pulp it unless you get a large payment, mm -hmm. we're going to see equivalents that the penalties that have to come with this for restitution would exceed all bounds compared to what you actually expected in the local context. Yeah, I think one of the things that is proposed by the Law Commission is that um, there would have to be a threshold for the vexatious complaint on the one hand and the, tr and the real complaint on the other. Difficult to work out how that threshold is going to be reached. And that, I think, is the reason why they've suggested a merged communications commissioner then to the tribunal. The commissioner would, would carry out that, that vetting effect and probably would engage in the mediation as well. The only problem is with mediation. That's a wonderful idea and it's great, and, but it's conditioned by the comment that you made of people of goodwill. Uh, you know, you read some of the stuff on the blogs that's going down, I really don't think that they're people of goodwill. I, I won't give an opinion on what they are, but no doubt mental health professionals could help. Um, yeah. Uh, hi. Martin. Yes, yeah, Martin. That's a, uh, I just wanted to pick up on uh, what David said earlier about uh, Jamie um, and just... <laughs> <laughs> No, I, the, um, it was specifically about the comment about whether the tribunal should be allowed to order takedowns, um, because there's obviously a very negative view about takedowns, and I, I would say that uh, you know a properly set up tribunal should be able to order takedowns. Um, to pick up on that previous point, basically, if your blog said, assume Jamie was a teacher, I can't, it's hard to imagine, but assume Jamie was a teacher, and your blog said uh, Jamie sleeps with his students, as, as long as that's up, that's massively damaging, and because the community says where there's smoke, there's fire, and all that kind of nonsense. The quicker you can get that down, the less damage it will do. And so there are times when I think a takedown is, you know, a reasonable tool. Marie. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, a, a point here briefly, and that is that, and Martin has, has kind of dealt with it, but remember that the Law Commission has also recommended that the Privacy Commissioner should have the power to have a, effectively a takedown. And this is operating more where, you know, like the flatmate who snaps a, a, per, a shot of the girl in the shower and then puts it up on the internet. And it, and that, and it seems to me you do need a takedown power, David, to um, pre pre protect the, the ordinary person, you know, going about their daily lives and being, you know, a, treated in a very offensive way. And the, just to reassure you, the takedown power that the Law Commissioner has proposed for me would be appealable, you know. So. There's plenty of option to um, argue the toss about whether or not you know all these other things apply, but it does seem to me that um, you've got to deal with the fact that people feel helpless in the face of of the sort of technology onslaught and the ability for very offensive material to be widely and persistently pervade. And so, you know, as Martin says, I think a quick takedown with an appeal is, doesn't seem to me to be terribly offensive to um, free speech. Marie, could I, could I just pick up on a comment that you've made there? Um, a, a takedown that is appealable. Are you suggesting that the, the material would be taken down subject to an appeal and if the appeal was successful the material would be restored? Or are you suggesting that there be a takedown notice and the, the notice would be appealed and then the material taken down and, and obliviated? Uh, well, um, thank you, Mr. Lawyer. <laughs> yes, it's, it's I notice. can't help it. It's in my DNA. I, I forgive you. I think <laughs> it's you. the notice um, that's appealable. But the idea would be to fast track it so that it would um, you know, sure. be able to be done quite quickly. Yep. OK. There was... Uh, yes. Hi, Richard Hulse. I'm on a um, school board of trustees. And um, a lot of the conversation I'm hearing already is about 
interactions between consenting adults who are relatively mature. Um, what I see as a trustee is students who have been subjected to systematic bullying via social media, sometimes over months and months. Um, and then, of course, they appear before the discipline committee because they've retaliated in the physical. Um, you know, these, these remedies, of course, are, are suitable for intelligent adults who can, um, you know, possibly mediate and, you know, discuss. But for students, you know, they don't want to rat on other students, you know, they don't want to... But they want to fit in, you know. Um, sure. You know, acceptance. Yeah, they want acceptance. But, in fact, I think we have a bigger problem with our young people in that they don't have any place to go. They don't necessarily have adults that they can talk to, and they don't know how to process this abuse, which is often very personal. Yes, I agree. I agree. It's very, very difficult. And, um, you know, the answer is not to say turn off the phone or, you know, don't log on. There was... Um, <laughs> contribution there, and yeah. maybe Lee might have so something to say about um, the cyberbullying site. Yes, please. Um, I just really want to ask how meaningful a takedown notice can be. Um, I can ask someone to take information off one block, but I can't guarantee that that information, that um, you know, photo that's been taken off me against my will, isn't mirrored throughout the internet by the time my takedown notice takes effect. Um, is it a, is it a, no, I don't think it's an unreasonable recourse. I just wonder if it's a possible recourse. Well, you, you raise a very interesting issue and it deals with some of the inherent qualities with a new communications technology and one of them is the persistence of information. Um, the, the takedown would be effective in that it could not be reached again. It may well have been distributed somewhere else. It may well be on, uh, on the internet archive for all we know. But the, I think the effect of the takedown notice is that it isn't immediately available, uh, and, and that would be the, the answer. Lee, do you have something to say about school kids and... and, and I, guess, I guess I do now, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the um, bullying that goes on between uh, students can be taken down because it's on places like Facebook which have terms and conditions and which will respond if it is reported. I think there's probably a little bit of lack of information about how to do that and you know we deal with that a lot. But I also say that um, some of the modelling that we see that happens for students is because adults um, are so vindictive and nasty online. <clears throat> so as long as you've got that, how can we expect young people to behave any differently, actually, um, when you know, the, the model in front of them is often uh, as bad as what they're doing to each other? But I agree, it is definitely a problem, and the distress and the ramifications of that distress, you know, we see a lot of, and it's huge. It can be absolutely huge. <clears throat> For a 14-year-old, they can't deal with that kind of persistent bullying that, that any of us could probably just go, ah, well, you know, they're, they're just being an idiot. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Cyberbullying was a uh, big issue in the United States, still is, but what I've noticed is that a lot of the schools now uh, have made it a number one priority, and it has sort of changed the culture of the students. They know what it is, they know when it happens, and so I guess what I would propose is perhaps uh, consumer education, parent education, student education, to, to let them know that this is not acceptable. There was this three-pronged approach to dealing with cyberbullying in the U.S. It was stop, block, and tell. And the stop part is, you know, if you are being bullied, rather than ranting back and pulverizing or, you know, getting your own expletives in, you just stop, you block it, and then you go tell someone. So that's what I think one of the real um, remedies would be, is to educate the students and the populace and let them know that it's not tolerated and that it is not okay. So notwithstanding the First Amendment, you've got a social uh, solution, uh, much in the same way as was suggested over here. Uh, deal with it within the community. Uh, don't necessarily make a law, because the, the approach in this country uh, is, you know, something's wrong, let's make a law, let's regulate it. Well, um, sometimes the law 
laws are either too hot or too cold. Sure. If you notice in the incident of the Rutgers student, Ravi, I don't remember his last name, where yep. he had a camera on his roommate uh, who was gay and the roommate subsequently committed suicide, I think he got off uh, with 30 days uh, of community service. So some would say that that remedy was too cold and then mm -hmm. others uh, too hot where you would put a youngster in, you know, in jail. That probably would not be a good remedy either if they're in jail sure. for a long period of time. Sure. Can I, yes. I think the takedown remedies are very useful as long as you're uh, after somewhere that ends with dot NZ. Uh, the takedown remedies will be of absolutely no use at all anywhere else in the world. Uh, and uh, so while I think uh, the solutions proposed are all excellent, they're not going to get rid of the problem by any means at all. Most bloggers, for example, use one of the proprietary systems uh, Blogspot or one of the others, uh, and none of them are hosted in New Zealand. So where's the jurisdiction to order the takedown? Well, <clears throat> okay, Chris, interesting point that you raised there because there was a case. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to be a lawyer, but um, it was way back um, in the 1990s where there was a website that was hosted in California where the uh, administrator of the website was present in New Zealand and the administrator was ordered, ordered to take the uh, offending material down. It was a domain name case, New Zealand Post and Ling. And uh, that was a case where there was jurisdiction because the, the person who had control of the site was in this country. Um, I think that, that that's one way of doing it, although I do agree with you, uh, you know, getting WordPress or Blogspot or whatever to take the stuff down is difficult, but if the author, um, Farah is good at throwing other people's names around, so I'll throw his around. <laughs> Farah, Farah is here in the country. He can be enjoined to remove the offending material from WordPress. Yeah, and I think that's the answer. Yeah, I, I, I've got direct experience of how this doesn't sure. work terribly well because uh, in my day job, uh, I investigate complaints about things like this. Uh, and in this case, it was a Canadian businessman who said that this particular website had uh, a lot of uh, defamatory allegations about his business practices, uh, which may or may not have been correct. Uh, the person who was posting it, however, did several things which made it virtually impossible. They uh, posted them all on a website which was uh, very pro-freedom of speech in yep. the United States. Sure. Uh, and the second thing is they gave false who is information. So, uh, you know, if you... Oh, the truly dedicated misbehaviour wrist uh, is going to find a way around it, no question. There's a contributor at the back there. We've been uh, making a lot of comments about jurisdiction and where the server is. We try to define the jurisdiction in some sort of arbitrary way, but the, the fact is if I meet someone on the internet, I don't say I met them on a server that was hosted in uh, California. Um, so the internet is a place, but there's no, there's no high court of the internet, there's no government of the internet, there's governance, which is uh, vetoed by um, the Department of Commerce in the US, but there's no internet place. And um, I guess the issue is when you want to move to a country, if I want to move to Australia, I need to uh, accept the right that I may be sent to prison for X amount of time. I may be fined for doing certain things. Um, how do I get internet citizenship? Can we make an internet where uh, people need to pledge you know, some huge sum of money? Um, like when you, when you rent out a house, if you leave the house in a bad state, you don't get your bond back. What if there's a bond of $20,000 to join the certain internet and if you, uh, you, you can have access to that, but if you misbehave, you, know, you accept whatever punishment or you forfeit your $20,000 and leave. I reckon there's a notion of the internet, if it is a real place, should we start treating it like a real place? No, well, the internet isn't a place. Uh, the internet's just a communication system that enables people to behave in a certain way. The problem is not the technology, the problem is the behaviour. We've met the enemy, he's us. 
But if you're talking about jurisdiction, then there's yeah, more people across different I, jurisdictions. I, I, can, I, can, I can have a long discourse with you about jurisdiction perhaps after the session, um, but I'm sure there are other contributors. Mike O'Donnell, yeah. Cheers. Um, a little bit in context of what Pamela's saying, but also the earlier comment, the, the proposed institution um, would be able to develop good relationships with some of the big global players. I know from personal experience that um, my dear old mum in Tamuka is going to have bugger all chance getting Google to take something down or getting um, a phishing site taken down from a website. But if other institutions in New Zealand approach those and have got an existing relationship, then the effect can be a lot more immediate and quick. And this organisation, if it was to work, David, I think we'd have to have those sort of relationships with key players. Let's give up perfection for a moment. This is the internet. It's not perfect, like me, according to my wife. Um, but, you know, perfection... What, is perfect or not perfect? Well, I think, no. <laughs> let, let, let's forget perfection. This is the internet. It ain't perfect. Um, but what it could do is have a pretty good whack at it, I think. Um, and the other thing, too, is if people here are long enough in the tooth to remember the unsolicited electronic messages act and I was against I thought what a waste of time you know most of the spam I get is from offshore it actually even though it's just a New Zealand act actually had a pretty good effect and it means all these you know um, flogs like David Farrar who sent me unsolicited emails um, if it if I don't have the ability to unsubscribe at the bottom then shit I will report it and something will happen yeah sure um, and, and let's also not forget there was comment about community or self-moderation there, that would still continue. And in some ways, the line as to what's allowed and what isn't allowed would be drawn more cleanly and more sharply because of the pre precedents coming out of this organisation. That, the communications commissioner, I would see as being the organisation that would, would lock in with the Googles and the Facebooks and the, and the, the internet conglomerates. Yes? Uh, Jeff Houston from Australia. I see a whole bunch of issues around enforceability but I see issues around enforceability in many things that we do as a society, and particularly in an area where communication is involved, where the parties involved and the act you're doing can be in three different places all at once. But that shouldn't stop any community from clearly expressing their values and expectations of behaviour from and within themselves. So I think you should clearly express those values about what you think is inappropriate behaviour and speak cleanly about how you would like to see that enforced and within the power of your jurisdiction, enforce it. And yes, you are going to find a whole bunch of corner cases and yes, you might well find some behaviour where if I wish to defame you, I go and get a server in the Ukraine. But that doesn't stop you from saying that it's wrong and it should not happen. So, you know, I would not worry about, if you will, the corner cases that are out there. They will always be there. And I would actually clearly state what you believe are appropriate values as a community. Exactly. You're, you're seeing the, the, any sort of <clears throat> solution, be it legal or otherwise, as reflecting values uh, rather than anything else. OK, that's, that's a really interesting suggestion because uh, it kind of gets around the ideas of repression and so on if we are going to look at important values because one of those values, of course, must be freedom of expression. Uh, and I think we value that as much as we value the people who, who abuse uh, freedom of expression. Um, there was a contributor. Yes. Um, following on from what Jeff said, I think that we have um, a, a hierarchy of intervention that we all understand in our heads. Um, the first one is, is relatively implicit. It's the social contract. It's our culture. You know, just by being politer and nicer to people, that's how we prevent bad behaviour. The second one is the level of responsible hosting. You know, companies like Google and others and Facebook who to some degree make an attempt to be responsible in the way that they run their sites. Then we get to tribunals and arbitration, such as communications tribunal, and finally we get to the courts, you know. Um, and it, it's in all of our interests to try to do this at the lowest levels of the hierarchy before you have to get to the higher levels of the hierarchy. You know, so we want this to happen just in the basic social contract of people being more mature and nicer to each other. Um, but it's interesting to, to recognise that as we are forced up that by determined people, that's when jurisdiction becomes more important. And that actually makes it much harder to do when you have to take jurisdiction into account because, you know, the, the internet is a global phenomenon. And I would suggest that many people who are saying, oh, you can't get Google to do this, you can't, you know, get Google to do that, actually should try because most of these 
companies have been through a very painful internal process of recognising that they are, have to be responsible, recognising that they have to be responsible globally at a grassroots level almost, so they have to listen to individual people making individual complaints, not just listen to the courts and others, and have processes in place of doing that, and actually getting much better at doing that. And so we are seeing more things being able to be knocked off at the very basic level before we force further up that hierarchy to more authoritarian ways of dealing with things. Sure. One of the, one of the issues, of course, and, and I think this came from your comment, Jeff, is uh, recognising that people misbehave and deal with the people who misbehave. But the other thing, of course, is what we're going to do with the content and how we're going to deal with, the, with this issue of, of um, the fact that it's going to be around uh, for a long, long time unless we do something about it. Um, did somebody have the microphone? Yes. Um, we've done a lot of talking about takedown as a remedy. Um, I'm a target of ongoing harassment. It's been going for about half a decade from someone who doesn't want women to do open source and wants me out. Um, a takedown isn't a remedy, thank you. A, a takedown isn't a remedy in the slightest to this scenario and we're hearing a lot from people who host who are worried about their takedown notices and people worried about free speech. And I'd like to hear more from the people who are the targets of this and what would be a good remedy. For me, that comment being deleted or not promoted or that tweet going isn't going to stop. It's going to be another comment next week. Um, so a takedown, it's not a remedy. OK. What about some kind of um, restraining order on the person stopping them from putting the tweet out there in the first place? Because that's under the, you can get a restraining order under the Harassment Act. Uh, yeah, whether they live is important. Um, my point was more um, we should talk about other remedies, or sure. are there people who are the targets who are asking for takedown? Because I okay. haven't heard that. Sure, because restraining would, would help you. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's two there's two kind of obvious examples in the New Zealand environment: Vince Seema versus Michael Stiesny, which which was utterly futile and just. We wasted an enormous amount of money and, and achieved very little, apart from eventually getting Vincema in jail and establishing some nice court precedents about contempt. Um, and then we've currently got whale oil versus um, a chap called Bloomfield, who's now suing him for defamation, but equally futile, I suspect, in the final analysis. So um, there is a distinct problem in the law seeking to achieve futile aims and then looking ridiculous as a result? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't think I'd better comment about either case. <laughs> uh, only, only to say that um, I think the proposals that the Law Commission is making about a communications tribunal recognises some of the difficulties about Defamation, for example, which is in a phenomenally complex and expensive process to go through and quite beyond the reach of most people. Um, and the other, the other issue, of course, is the willingness of people to comply with court orders. And that is a fundamental thing, because if you don't comply with a court order, then there is the contempt remedy. But, you know, you can be binned for contempt and then just go out and do it all over again. Um, yeah, and, and there are people who are, are not happy about complying with court orders, and that's just the problem. But in this respect, I think the Communications Tribunal at least will offer some kind of speedy solution uh, and, and a cheap solution uh, to, uh, for people who would find it otherwise impossible uh, to go before a court or the established procedures that we have. It's a fast-track justice solution. Yes? Um, just following on from both Brenda and Alistair, when someone is offshore, uh, can we hold them in contempt? And although it's kind of toothless because they're offshore, can we, can we, you know, basically say, you know, you're not welcome in New Zealand, or when you turn up in New Zealand, you're going to have this thing thrown at you? Well, that's a, possi and that's a possibility. Fly that across all the other companies, uh, other countries. Uh, where New Zealanders are going to those countries and, and, and so on and so forth. And do we want to do that? Uh, the person, well, OK. Um, the person offshore uh, can be subject to New Zealand jurisdiction. Um, 
and, and I'm not going to go into the detail about that because it's kind of complicated. But just, um, you know, trust me, I'm a lawyer. Um, <laughs> yes, Your Honour. Uh, you can. Uh, the other thing about extradition, I'd rather not go there. <laughs> Can't say I didn't try. <laughs> David, if I could just make a comment about uh, your feeling about this seems to be very clearly through the points that you've emphasised, and I think you're correct, is you know, when somebody commits a crime, it's not undoable. If I were to punch David Farrar in the nose because he said I was a bankrupt, you can't unpunch his nose. No. And as Brenda points out, takedowns, it's, it's too late. People have seen me naked in the shower and you're all laughing at me now. So this, this idea that somehow the one-way arrow of time can be reversed by legislation and the operation of a commission is, is not true. Now, I'm sure I'm going to get the argument, well, no, we can't undo it, but we can stop it from persisting. And you've, you've done the persisting thing. And I'm sure Martin Crocker has mentioned that the problems are often that it continues. But even so, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you can't undo the crime. So how do you make people more resilient to it? Okay. Now, there's, a, there's a good claim over here that we're all grown up adult human beings. And if you were to insult me continuously, I would just brush it off. The hell. Um, and I think Jeff's point about we want to express our cultural values, even if they're unenforceable. Well, then I'd go to Lee's statement that a lot of the bullying that we see in children is actually modelling, I don't know, Parliament, our sporting activities. Sure, what happens on the sideline. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've just seen a, a couple of referees uh, give, up, give up the game hmm. because they can't stand it. So, I mean, I think we just have to be very, very clear about what our cultural values are, aspirationally, yes, but actually empirically, I'm not so sure. And if I can just, one last point. You talked about an intensive campaign by the New Zealand Herald regarding Cyber victims of, of bullying, Cyber bullying, and that's mm. just tragic. It's, yeah, it's shocking. There's no question. Happens to a very, very small minority of people, and I just wish it didn't. But before we get carried away with the idea that this is an issue of, for children, my recollection of a, the minutes of a meeting of NetSafe, and this is from a way back, was that the calls, 60% of the calls to their 505 line at that time were from people over the age of 18. Yep. Sure. So this, this isn't an issue about protecting the children. You don't gain any leverage out of that. It's protecting us all from the bad behaviour, and whether that's going to be solved by legislation in the same way that children's faces are no longer ripped off by dogs because they're now microchipped or not, um, I think that's, that's the really bigger question. And I think you're right that the knee-jerk reaction in New Zealand is bad. If we just make a law against it, it'll stop happening. Well, I haven't seen that at all. Yeah. Yeah, right, thank you. Just, just to, uh, I'll, I'll be with you in a moment. Just to take a point on the arrow of time, if I can use the metaphor. Um, no, we can't undo the punch. Uh, no, we can't bring back the dead. But what we can do is we can recognise that somebody has misbehaved or fallen below the standard or uh, has offended against the values, <coughs> hold them responsible and call them to account. That's what it's about. Sorry, that's the end. I absolutely agree with that. Okay. Uh, and it doesn't undo the punch. Yep, okay. Yes? I was merely going to point out that sometimes these problems are actually quite old. Oh, yeah. And, and newspapers and newsprint have had to deal with this because you can't do a takedown on yesterday's paper. No. Nope. And the internet, to think you can do a takedown, it's actually amazingly complicated once the search engines have been across you. That's right. And I think you should look at the remedies to this kinds of social behaviour. And takedowns aren't necessarily a complete remedy. What you're talking about before about recognising 
values of the community and how you wish to express those values when folk obviously are abusing the individual trust we place in each of us. Those things are important. And takedowns don't erase the problem and cannot. Maybe you should consider retractions and other forms that the newspapers ultimately had to go to yep. to rectify their own obvious issues. Sure. At the time. Sure. Yes. I was just going to make the point that um, one thing about bullying becoming cyberbullying means that we can see it a bit more clearly because I don't know about everyone else, but I grew up before the internet and there was lots of horrible bullying that went on without the internet. Um, and that now that the internet's there and you can see what people are saying about each other on Facebook, maybe it's a little bit easier for the community to recognise that problem and deal with it. It's not quite so secret and hidden. and um, what used to happen if somebody claimed bullying, it would just be denied, it would be swept under the carpet, there was no proof of it. Well, you can actually see what people are saying now and we can be a bit clearer about this is inappropriate. This behaviour can be disapproved of by the rest of the community. Sure. M Martin, in, in just a moment, one thing about the values business though, <clears throat> and, and I'm, I'm, I have a, a, a theory that I'm developing that in fact the law reflects values and, and values underpin the law, uh, it isn't just something that, that happens, uh, is that with new communications technology and particularly the way that we're going through the pace of change right now and have been for the last 20 or so years, values change and the problem that you have is that once you've passed the law, if I can put it that way, you're freezing the values so that 20 years down the track you've got the same values which are incorporated in the law which may not be recognised by the next generation. And that's, that's one of the problems that you have with the law which is um, kind of like a glacier in terms of, of, of its size, its bulk, its mass and its immovability. Uh, it moves very, very slowly. Now, there was a comment. Yes. Uh, Martin, you've got the microphone. Yeah, I and do. Then again. Now I've got the floor. Um, the uh, thing about takedowns for me is not... Uh, I, I just think that you, sh you shouldn't necessarily take any potential powers away from the tribunal. So uh, the takedown should be one of the options available to them. I don't know that you'd ever want it to be the go-to option. Um, the 60% uh, the is an interesting thing. I mean, that uh, raises the point that every day people ring NetSafe, a number of people ring NetSafe, and the reason they ring NetSafe is because they have run out of other options. So the great majority of people who ring us have tried to sort out their harassment issues, their defamation issues, whatever, and they've been turned away by everybody else. So, so those are the people that we're looking for a, a remedy for. Uh, and yeah, I mean, 60% of them are adults because a lot of the stuff uh, that happens with kids gets resolved within the school so it doesn't get through to NetSafe. It's probably still fair to say that cyberbullying is more common amongst youth than amongst adults, but not the stuff that comes through to NetSafe because the level of seriousness of, the, of what we have to deal with. A colleague of mine did make an order in a harassment case about taking down uh, material that was harassing on a blog, uh, and that material was taken down, uh, and it was, uh, it was a proceeding under the Harassment Act. Yes, Ian. I just wonder whether you got a comment. I've got uh, 13 and 11 year old grandchildren and computers at my place, and I'm very concerned about, uh, like Facebook's got a 12, it's supposed to say, are you 12 years old, right? And the experience is almost all of their friends have been given permission to log on by their parents. I wonder whether there's anything we can do to strengthen the recommendation for maturity uh, on games and sites. That's, that, I think, is a, is a real family issue. You were going to... Just quickly, one thing that sort of... You did mention it in passing as the concerted efforts of a, you know, a, a dedicated troublemaker. How would we deal with um, an anonymity, though? Um, well, there are ways. Um, one of them is through IP numbers and, and IP tracking. And <laughs> Well, he, he asked, I'm answering. <laughs> I'm answer I, he, he wants to know, so I'm telling him. Uh, you mightn't like the answer, but it's there. Would I know if I was being tracked? Hmm? Would I know if I was being tracked? Nope. And when they come along to the, IP, with the, to the internet service provider with an application under the, for, uh, for what is called a Norwich Pharmacal order, you're not going to know about that either. So, yeah, there are a whole lot of issues about IP tracking. Because I, because I raise it doesn't mean to say I approve of it. All right? Um, there was a contributor at the back. Yes, Lynn. Um, it's also 
probably something that legislation can't legislate against, and probably there should be an education thing to the citizens at large as to how to protect their privacy, because I don't think people realize how much of their data is available online. And all you have to do is for some hacker to just pack three or four places and put their stuff online that you realize how much of your stuff. I mean, those of you who are on public transport, whether in Auckland or Wellington, every time you swipe onto the bus, it says whether you, where you've gone. Yep. And that information is available online for you to check your stuff so a hacker sure. can get to it. Um, anyone who signs up to loyalty programs, that's also there. People who sign up through Facebook, if you want to go to Pinterest, you have to have Facebook and all the shared IDs. You know, your, your movements can be tracked. So how much of that data are you trusting to corporations that are not even part of those big corporations like, yeah. say, your ISPs or something? Sure, and that's... You're hoping that they would protect you? Yeah, that's a data collection privacy uh, issue, but it also has things to do with, with the way in which you manage your own identity online. Um, Russell. Yeah, I've got the mic. And I'm we've Angela. got and we've got three minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, just really quickly, I'm just a teacher at the Chalk Face um, Technology in a boys' school. Um, just really interesting to hear the comments that are going around. They sort of go to an adult level of talking about defamation um, into law and values, and then back into sort of um, down into cyberbullying and bullying, and then sort of down into the children. Um, really interesting. I think that. Um, from the snapshot I get, NetSafe are amazing, they do an amazing job, I think they're totally underfunded um, in comparison with other countries around the world with what they're able to do and the millions thrown at government to them. Um, but they're an amazing resource that educators grab um, and, and, and work with. Talking about educators, they have to um, imbue a value system into students of all ages to do with cyber citizenship, safety and literacy. Um, many of the educators are not confident to do that. They can work with the tools, just like adults work with the tools of the technology, as do the children, but may not actually have the expertise or the confidence to work in that area of what is behind the tools we're using. Um, so comes a value system, and I think that um, as educators too, we're trying to keep up with the knowledge that the tools have been using, used extensively with expertise by children and using the technology, but with little wisdom. Um, and we are a little bit reliant on some laws coming to back up our values that we imbue into the children, um, as with teaching parents as well, to help them get on board and feel confident about looking after their growing children. Um, and uh, so one of the, my points is, is yes, values um, is hugely important, underpins law, and law underpins values, I agree. Secondly, uh, government, government needs to put lots more money behind um, education in this area into schools and parents. They are the coming through generation. Thirdly, reputation management with youth, really developing. Um, it's not compulsory in schools to do any of this. Um, it's embedded in what we call an e-learning framework that citizenship, safety, and literacy is taught. Um, but teaching youth, they want to talk about Facebook. They want to talk about all of the issues but are there the people around them who can talk them through that from a point of wisdom, not just their peers and how they use it as a tool and entertainment and social connect tool. They actually want to get under and understand it and sure. establish themselves from that point of view. Thank you. Russell. And I think we'll make Russell's comment the last. Um, I, oh, how nice. Um, I, I think last word, Russell. I, I think we're in danger of developing a bit of magical thinking about takedowns here. Um, if, if I'm moderating a, an online discussion, I am the first arbiter. If I decide something is defamatory or offensive, I will take it down. By the time I get to it, it's probably been crawled at least once by Google. But the idea that I cannot limit further damage by taking it down seems ludicrous to me. Uh, if it's a historical issue and I've struck this like David once or twice, uh, I won't take it down. I'll annotate the offensive or defamatory material to make clear that it's, it's not valid. But uh, the idea that you can't limit damage by taking something down just doesn't make sense to me. OK, thank you, Russell. The indicating that there's a responsibility on blog hosts as well. People, thank you very much. I think this has been an interesting session. Um, it's a conversation that's going to continue, and the Law Commission will be coming out with its report, I have no doubt, very soon. 
you'll have an opportunity, no doubt, to continue the conversation. This has been your session. Thank you very much. Um,